Hi everybody, I'm Don Dixon and I'm really thrilled to be back uh, from my vacation. We had a great time. Wife and I with the family uh, enjoyed our couple of weeks down there on the beach, but I've sort of neglected uh, my duties here uh, making videos. So I'm happy to be back and, and excited about starting a brand new uh, area of discussion today. And that area of discussion, uh, I'm just going to call it what it is, fishing gear. There's so much gear out there today that people seem to get a little bit confused as to just what it is they should be buying and so on and so forth. And, and uh, if you reflect back with me for a minute, everything we've talked about so far over the last few months brought us to the last story we talked about, which was creating depth and speed. Once we're out on the water, once we've located the areas where the fish are, we have to be able to present lures and, and, and control our depth and speed in order to catch those fish. It's one thing to know where they are, but it's another thing to catch them. So uh, we established over, I think it must have been three or four vlogs, we talked about all of the different uh, components of creating the proper depth and speed control. That without question, I got bass jumping out here. Without question. If we want to successfully catch fish each and every time we go out, we must be in the right place at the right time, bringing a bait by a fish at the right speed in order to have that success. Depth and speed. Uh, there, there should be at this point, after all that we talked about, there should be no question in your mind. Those are the two things we must control in order to catch fish. Now, that brings us to our new topic of discussion. Our new series starting today, I'm basically going to introduce it today, then we'll get more involved over the next couple of sessions. But we should understand at this point that if everything that I shared with you is true, which it is, and controlling our depth and speed is what we're going to attempt to do out there, obviously we have to have some gear that's going to allow us to do that, fishing gear. Our sport is like no, uh, is just like every other sport. You have to have tools in order to go out there and compete. We're competing against the fish. We're not competing against people. We're competing against the fish. But we need some tools to do it. We need some fishing gear. We need rods. We need reels. We need lures. We need boats. We need motors and so on and so forth. We need a bunch of stuff. Now, the problem that most fishermen have today is they don't know what gear to buy. They don't know what gear to equip themselves with. Mainly because they don't know that they don't know about what it is we're trying to control out there. And we, you and I, have come to this conclusion over the last four or five weeks that there's really only two things we need to control, depth and speed. So as we start this discussion, on what lures and what rods and what reels and what line and all of the things that we would consider tools uh, in our gear. When we start to consider them, we, we need to simply be thinking in terms of which ones allow me to best control the two things I need to control, my depth and speed. All gear should be looked at in those terms. If you remember when we started talking about depth and speed, I said in, in, the end of our, in the end of all of our discussions, of all of our studies, we always sort of simply come back to how do we control our depth and speed so we can catch fish. And this is another example of it. So as we enter into this discussion, into this study, it's not going to be long. We're only going to be two or three sessions on proper gear. But keep in mind, my interest is only what gear, and should be your interest only, what gear allows me to best control all of the depths, the many depths, and the many speeds that are called for to be successful 100% of the time? My job is to tell the truth about catching fish. And what lure you use, or what reel you use, or what rod you use, or what boat motor you use, that's up to you. I have no dog in that fight. All I ever told people was this. If the gear you're using currently 
or the gear you're contemplating purchasing does not allow you to control depth and speed, get rid of it. Don't use it. Don't buy it. If you already own it, discard it like yesterday's newspaper. We have to control our depth and speed. And if your gear doesn't allow you to do it, you need to change. So even though this is just going to be a few, a few sessions on gear, it's important because our gear simply uh, will either allow us uh, to control our depth and speed or it won't. And controlling our depth and speed is the difference between catching fish and not catching fish. But before we get started on the details on what gear I suggest that you might use, uh, I want you to first hear a little story about the day I met Buck Perry. It has some significance as we begin our discussion on tools, and I want you to hear it. If you haven't read about it before or heard it, I want you to hear it, I'll do a little review of it, and once we do that, then we'll get into the specifics of exactly what tools I suggest that you need to control your depth and speed out there on the water. So here we go. I'm in Florida on a vacation. I'm a 29-year-old stockbroker in Pittsburgh. I need a vacation. Uh, there was something called the Russian wheat deal back in the day, and I was dealing commodities as well. And I took a little bit of a hit, a uh, pretty serious hit, actually, as I recall. <laughs> but at any rate, I needed some time off. I had some great clients, some sports guys from Pittsburgh. I, I, had, I had a nice business going, but I needed some time off. So I decided I'm going to take a little trip to Florida and, and follow my passion, which has always been fishing, go down there and see if I couldn't get into some of those lily pads down there, throw some topwater baits, you know, and catch one of them big old 10-pound Florida bass. Never been to Florida, ever. And I was excited. I did some research on some great bass lakes, known as great bass lakes, rolled down into Florida, fish in Orange Lake in a little place called McIntosh, Florida. Big lake, 20,000 acres. Big round lake, and it was completely rimmed with lily pads. I mean, it was beautiful. It was like you just go with your camera and shoot pictures. You know, it was gorgeous. It's what every bass fisherman always grew up dreaming about that had never seen it before, and that was me. Man, I saw those lily pads. I couldn't wait to get out there and start casting that. I just knew that 10-pounder would have my name on it for sure. Three days later, I had not caught one fish. I don't mean I didn't catch a 10 pounder. I mean, I didn't catch a 12 incher. I caught zero fish in three days. Now, right at the lake, there was this little diner. I can't remember the name of it, it's not important. But it was just a little diner. And I would eat dinner in there every night because, uh, you know, I eat sandwiches and stuff for lunch, but it dinner time I have a little dinner and they had a lot of this home cooked stuff you know like uh, meatloaf and all, all the good stuff that you grew up with right so I'm eating in there and I'm sitting at the counter because I'm by myself and I'm sitting at the counter there's a few tables out there you know in the, in this little restaurant and on the third night after total frustration and failure I'm sitting there I got my nose down in that mashed potatoes and gravy and I was not a happy camper I was really frustrated I hadn't caught a fish in three days. And here I am in this magical place that I had read about all my life, you know, going to Florida, catching these big old 10 pound bass. So I'm sitting there at the counter, nose down in those mashed potatoes and gravy. I must have been, look, I must have been a real sad sack if anybody saw me that day. And I'll never forget, all of a sudden the door opened and a bunch of guys rushed in. They were like they was at somebody's uh, uh, bachelor party or something or some birthday party. They are just laughing and carrying on and having fun and yelling and screaming. I thought, what in the world in the middle of this little country place? What in the world's going on here? Well, they put a few tables together. There was about eight or nine of them. Put a few tables together and it was so close to the counter I, I could overhear everything that they were saying. And it wasn't too long till I got the gist of their uh, hilarity and how thrilled they were with their little day. They started talking about all the big bass they were catching out there in the lake. And they were talking about one guy said, I never forget. He said, 
that you didn't catch three 10 pounders today. You only caught two. That last fish only weighed nine and a half pounds. It wasn't 10. I said, what, huh, what? You only caught two 10 pounders today? Cause one was only nine and a half. You gotta be kidding me. So the more I listened, obviously my ears perked up and, and the whole conversation around those, those tables was nothing but catching all these big fish. After about a half hour, I couldn't take it anymore. Now mind you, I'm from Pittsburgh. <laughs> Pittsburghers will know what I'm talking about. I just couldn't sit there. I just got up, went over and, and interrupted their dinner. Said, you got to excuse me, but I got to interrupt your dinner. I got to know. You guys aren't talking about fishing this lake out here or this orange lake, are you? Is that where you've been fishing? They said, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's where we've been fishing. I said, uh huh? <laughs> I just couldn't believe it. They were talking about catching 100 fish, you know, and all these big, huge bass. And I haven't caught a 10 incher yet in three days. And I could cast with the best of them. Now, listen, I used to practice all that stuff. I was pretty good at my mechanics. Just couldn't catch fish. So I noticed that in this conversation, when people would have a question or they'd make a statement, they always looked at this guy at the end of the table. He was actually at the head of the table. And I thought at the time, this an old geezer. I look back on it, I think he was 56 at the time. <laughs> so he wasn't all that old. But he was weather beaten. I mean, you could tell this guy been out there in the boat. You know, you could just tell. And the one guy said to me after one of my silliest questions, and I started asking questions. I wondered what they catching them on, where are they catching them. You know, all the normal stuff that a rude person from Pittsburgh would go in and ask. You know, bust right in on him. And he said, "Wait a minute, let me tell you something." He said, we're, we're outdoor writers, and there were guys there from outdoor life, from sports of field, fishing facts, and this guy at the end of the table, they said, that's Mr. Perry. And, oh, by the way, Mr. Perry is the guy who revolutionized modern-day fishing. He is simply the greatest fisherman ever lived. And I looked at this, quote, old geezer, you know, and I looked at him, and he said, son, did I understand you to say that you've been fishing here two, three days and you ain't caught the first fish just like that? <laughs> I said, listen, you heard me right. I said, I'm not too proud to admit it. I haven't even seen a fish in three days. And I said, I've cast every lily pad just about in this entire lake. Haven't caught one, even one little silly fish. He said, well, son, let me tell you this. If you'll just show up tomorrow morning, 6 o'clock, we're here doing some fishing. We're going to be here a few more days. You show up tomorrow morning at sunup and, and let the old man take you out there. I'll take you out there and show you how to catch fish out there in that lake. Really? Man, I didn't know how to react to that. This, this is somebody that these writers are telling me, this is the greatest fisherman who ever lives going to take me fishing. On his nickel, an intruder, and in some cases, I look back on that, I was probably pretty just, I was pretty rude. Just going in there and demanding some answers, you know, from all these guys. And this guy said, you show up tomorrow morning. He said, I'll take you out there. He said, I can't spend a lot of time with you. We'll spend a couple of hours. I'll show you how to catch fish out there, orange lake. Okay. So, boy, that night. Back in the day, I had a van, you know, I had a bed in the van. I'm sleeping in the van. I couldn't go to sleep. I was so excited. And those writers, they talked all, the rest of that evening, and they included me in the conversation. They were catching lots of fish, and I mean lots of big fish, with not a lot of details. So I couldn't sleep that night, but finally, sun, sun up came. And I went down there, had all my gear ready to go. I went down to the dock. And the old timer sitting down there in his boat. He's already there. He's ready to go. And he looked up at me and he said, son, just take your tackle back to your truck. Just leave, it, you leave your tackle here. I got all, everything we need right here. So I took all my gear back up to my tools, <laughs> back up to the truck. 
locked everything up. I came back down, and as I got closer and closer and closer to the dock, I want you, with me, I want you to visualize this if you can. I'm going to try to paint the picture for you. But let's say you're 29 years old. Let's say you're me. You're 29 years old. You're a fishing fanatic. But you've never had much success. And now here you are in the most beautiful bass country in the world. And you spent three days making all these fancy behind the back cast and everything you could do. And you haven't caught the first fish. And all of a sudden now, out of just a happenstance meeting in a little local diner, Here's the greatest fisherman who ever lived, according to all these writers. Now, when I found out they're from Outdoor Life and Sports Field, these aren't chumps. These are guys that have been around the business. They must know what they're talking about. So now, after not sleeping all night, I'm going to go fishing with the greatest fisherman that ever lived. I look down at his boat. Let me tell you. Now, go with me now. Be with me. You're transferring yourself into me. I look at his boat. It's made out of some kind of funky foam, a, sort of a cross, I don't even know how to describe it, a, a cross between sort of fiberglass foam, something or other. It was about 14 feet long. It was filthy dirty. <clears throat> and it looked like it was probably 30 years old. And inside his boat, he had some gallon milk jugs. And on those milk jugs, there was some string wrapped around it, and there were some old railroad ties, heavy railroad ties tied to the end of the string. He had about eight of those things in the front of his boat. He looked like somebody was going to maybe go out, you know, like the catfishing guy going out there, you know, stringing his line up, you know, or something. And I thought, what in the world is that? And then I looked back at his engine. He had a nine and a half horsepower Johnson. And you know, it, it, back in that day, it had a white top on it. And I hate to tell this on Buck, but I have to. When I met him, he chewed tobacco. You know, you, you pull out that apple jack, whatever it is, you know, slice you a big piece, and, you know. Now I played a lot of baseball growing up, so I knew <laughs> I knew what a chew was, even though I never touched it. But here, here he was, he chewing tobacco. And when I looked at the top of his engine, it was just covered with tobacco juice. I find out later how that is. He'd turn around and spit, and half of it go in the water, and half of it go on his engine. So here I am looking at this boat like an old river boat that I didn't even know. I bet you you could have bought one for $150. I mean, it was just it was a piece of junk in my eyes. And the engine... With all that tobacco, it was, an, it was a used engine. It was probably, at the time, maybe six, eight years old. Just covered with tobacco juice. And he didn't care. And I'm thinking to myself at this point, put yourself in my shoes now. I'm thinking, oh, man, I've made some kind of mistake here. <laughs> this can't be right. This can't be the greatest fisherman in the world. It just, there's no way. It can't be. I'm just really disappointed. And I haven't got in this boat yet. But I figured, well, I'm here, and they're talking about catching all these fish. I, I guess I'll go. So I get in the boat, and here's where the next little bit of fishing tools or gear comes into play. I got all the best casting rods. I got all the best reels. I got everything known to man, I'm telling you. I get in there, and first thing he does is bust out this little four-foot rod, four and a half feet long. He said, this is a trolling rod. He said, we're going to do a lot of trolling today. Now, back in 1970, nobody trolled for bass. That was an unheard of thing. In fact, even the walleye guys didn't do a lot of trolling. But the bass guys, there was no trolling. There was no such thing as trolling for bass. So when he said, we're going to do some trolling today, I'm thinking to myself, how are we going to go trolling through all them beautiful lily pads? <laughs> you know, nothing's making sense to me. And now I'm looking at this little four and a half, it was four and a half feet exactly. And on that rod was this little service reel. It was a saltwater service reel, just a little service reel, direct drive, you know, where the handle turned backwards when you're letting line out and that. So here I got a troll, four and a half foot trolling rod and a saltwater trolling reel to go bass fishing on Orange Lake. 
now I'm really confused. Like, this is making absolutely no sense. And if you were me back in those days, growing up reading every magazine there was, every good book there ever was written on fishing, I read everything. And I worked at my fishing. I was a pretty good fly fisherman, I'm a pretty good trout fisherman, but when it came to the summer stuff and the warm water species, I hardly ever caught any fish. Caught a straggler every now and then and it was never very big. So, all of a sudden, I am absolutely convinced I made a mistake. I shouldn't be doing this. I shouldn't be going out there. With it. Look, look at this gear. It's ridiculous. It's embarrassing. And this guy is supposed to be the best in the world. I was just shaking my head, but I was being polite. Someone told me one time, you're from Pittsburgh, it's probably hard for you to contest. No, I've always been polite. But I grew up in Pittsburgh, and now I'm not believing none of this. And I'm just going to have to be shown. So off we go, and as we're driving out with this little 10 horse engine with <laughs> tobacco juice all over the top, we're rolling out, and, and the lake was, when I say it was rimmed with lily pads, for about the first 50 yards or 75 yards of that lake, all the way around the lake, was solid lily pads. It was a gorgeous place. And that's where I've been spending my three days, of course. And he goes out, we go out this little canal and get out into the main lake. He cuts through all of those lily pads, and he keeps on going. Doesn't stop. And 20,000 acres in Florida, you can barely see the other shoreline. It's a long ways away. But when he started, when he went through those lily pads and kept on going out into the middle of the lake, I just knew he had this secret spot somewhere on the other side of the lake where I wasn't, hadn't been fishing. So I started picking up, well, maybe oh, he's going to have a good spot, you know. And we got out into about the middle of the lake, and he stopped the engine. He said to me, Donald, I'm going to tell you something I don't want you to ever forget. If you ever want to become a good fisherman, you need to never forget what I'm going to tell you right now. First thing you must accept is that deep water is the home of the fish. Now, that statement 50 years later, uh, it seems silly, that, but at the time, I thought this guy was crazy. I thought I had gone fishing with some looney tune. Who ever heard of fishing for bass in deep water out in the middle of a lake? I never heard of anything like that. And at the time, most nobody else had either. They, they, nobody had ever heard of anything like that. So now I know I'm, there's just no way I'm going to be able to catch fish with this guy. This is nuts. He said, deep water is the home of the fish. He said, now... A lot of people in Florida think, uh, well, that can't be true down here. It might be true up north, but not here because we don't have any deep water. Well, he said, yes, we do. And when I say the home of the fish is deep water, I say it like this. It's either the deepest water in the lake, the deepest water uh, in an area of a lake, or the deepest water available to a fish. That's where he's going to take up housekeeping. Don't ever forget it. He said, if you don't first accept that, by the way, nothing else I ever say will ever make any sense to you. So he said, remember, this is the day that your fishing life changed if you will trust me when I tell you. Deep water is a home of the fish. It's where they spend 95% of their entire life, somewhere in deep water. And he said, we've got some deep water right here. We've got about a 20-foot slot of water, and it runs for about a mile and a half down here. And he said, here's my fish. Not up there in those lily pads, which at this point in time was about a mile away, you know, or half a mile away from me. He said, they're not in the lily pads. Sure, during the spawn, the early season, a straggler fish here or there, you're going to find. But to school the fish. And he said, oh, by the way, all fish school. They school together according to size. And the big fish are really reluctant to move out of their deep water home. He said, now the fish are right here. They're in deep water. And so I've identified our fish. Now we got to figure out how we're going to catch them. He said, now here's where the trolling's going to come up, and I'll explain to you later. But first I've got to do a little work. He said, there's a little shelf, a little drop off, as he referred to it, that drops off of about 10 feet into this 20 foot of water. And he said, right at that drop off, 
It's what we call a break line. It's a line that runs on structure for a distance. And he said, I refer to that as a break line. And he said, we're going to be fishing this break line over this mile and a half. But since we're out here in the middle of this lake, with it's almost impossible to get any good shoreline sightings or anything. We're so far out there. And it's Florida. Everything flat. So he said, what we're going to do is I'm going to throw these markers out as a reference as to where we're going to be fishing. Okay. <laughs> these gallon jugs were the first markers ever developed. And he spent about a half hour and strung those jugs a mile and a half. And he said, now we're ready to fish. And he busts out that four foot <laughs> trolling rod. And that was my first introduction to a spoon plug. He said, now what we have to do is put a lure on that brake line where it's dropping off into this channel. We got to fish that brake line. He said, now what we're going to be doing, we got to cover all this area because fish will scatter along because it's only breaking about a foot. So the whole school of fish, when they hit it, they just scatter along the brake line. He said, so we're going to be trolling. Okay. And this is the rod we're using because in trolling, a long casting rod kind of thing will wear you out. You couldn't do that for more than a half hour. You'd be done for the day. You need a short, strong, tough trolling rod. And that's what I'm putting in your hands. Now, in order to put a lure on this brake line, we need a lure that's going to run right at around 10 feet. He said, so I'm going to give you this lure that I invented back in 1946. It's called a spoon plug. Back in those days, there were two lures, two types of lures made. One were plugs, which were made out of wood, and the other were spoons, which were made out of metal. He said, I couldn't think what to call it, so I called it a spoon plug. Okay. He said, here it is. Now, I want you to snap that on there. And he showed me how he had a little snap there, so I snapped it on. And he said, now, when I tell you to start letting line out, he said, we're going to be letting line out under power. And he said, I want you to count on your reel when, it, when your line goes, goes from one side of the reel to the other. That, that You count that as one layer of line. So I'm going to tell you, I want you to drop out 12 layers. So you count. One, one, two, three, four. And once you get that line out, he said, I want you to thumb down and put your brake up and hold on. Okay, I can do that. Pretty simple stuff. And then he broke out for the first time. He broke out that Applejack, cut him a slice, and he was ready to go fishing. <laughs> we started trolling along the outside of those barkers, and he was going so doggone fast. That was another thing. I, it just blew my mind. I said, what in the world? This guy going like 8, 10 miles an hour with this boat, just, just pushing that boat. And I could feel that lure working, you know. And I thought, he's going way too fast. What in the world? <laughs> now I know I'm not going to catch any fish. Pow! We didn't go 50 feet. I had the first fish. So, again, I want you to put yourself in my shoes. What would you think? We didn't go 50 feet. I got the biggest bass I've ever seen in my life. Now, I'm going to wrap up the story. You can read about it if you want to go on my blog, read the whole story. But... I'm going to just wrap it up for this so we can really end up getting to where we want to get to, which is a discussion on tools. But we continued to fish for about three and a half hours. And we didn't go five minutes. Anytime during that three and a half hours, we didn't go five minutes that one of us didn't have a fish on. And in many cases, both of us had a fish on at the same time. Trolling this silly looking lure using milk jugs as our guide in the ugliest boat I'd ever seen with, with a 10 horse engine with tobacco juice all over it. To say I was dumbfounded would be understating it, but I'm going to show you a picture of what the end of that day looked like and we stopped around 11.30 in the morning because he had to go out with those writers. He had to spend more time with them. But we kept a double limit of fish. And I want to show you that fish. And then I want to ask you this question. If you would have been me in that exact spot at that time, what would you have done? Do you think your gear might have changed? Do you think I ever bought a trolling rod? Yes. Do you think I ever bought a spoon plugs? Yes. Because my mother didn't raise a complete idiot. I was there. I saw it. 
everything he said and all of the conversation we had for three and a half hours led to the catching of those fish and I never forgot it and I started my career that day. I didn't realize I did, but I really did. And when I talk about tools, all I got to do to, to really make a point is go back to you. You want to catch fish like that? The tools that we were using that day, even though they were ugly and today way out of date in a sense, that was allowing us to control the depth and speed to bring a lure by a fish where he was at the right time and we were catching them. We caught them all morning long. Big bass. With that in mind, I'm going to start it. The next time we get together, I'm going to start talking about tools. Now that we have some, some more, some modern day sort of upgrades a little bit in certain areas, yes, we do. And I'm going to be telling you all about it. But keep in mind, depth and speed, like I never forgot that day. Depth and speed is what catches fish. So if you would, I want you to like us on Facebook and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And I want to say something about that. While I was on vacation, I saw this special on TV. It was a uh, undercover boss, and he talked about this gal who's been vlogging for, uh, I don't know, nine years, something like that. And she, they came out and said she had 10, over 10 million subscribers. Now, I looked at a couple of her vlogs just to see what the heck she was doing, because that just blew my mind away. And when I looked at her vlog, you know, she's talking to the young girls, because she's a young, pretty young girl. And they're talking about trying on prom dresses and stuff like that. And, but she has 10 million subscribers. Now, since we started this four and a half months ago, we have had nearly 30,000 views of our videos, but we only have 300 subscribers. And I've been told by the people that are involved with YouTube and that, that that's how you determine if people are enjoying and what, you know, and, and, and uh, they want, they like your videos and they want you to continue that's how you measure it by your subscribers. Well, I'm asking you today, if you're enjoying the videos, subscribe for us. That way I'll be able to track and see if I'm making a difference or not. And I need to know that to just continue. So if you're enjoying and you haven't subscribed, please do that for me. And I can tell you that girl that has 10 million subscribers, she knows nothing about catching a fish in 60 feet of water. So. If fishing is what you like and fishing is what you're doing and you're enjoying the videos, do me that favor, subscribe, and I appreciate you, and we'll see you the next time.